The flock, they are to exercise oversight. They are, and it's not to be for, for personal gain, but they're not under compulsion uh, as if it was necessary for them to hold that position, but it's voluntary. Not lording over us, but providing leadership. They are to set the example. And in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, he talked about... Uh, they are our leaders. They are to rule well. They keep watch over our souls. They will give an account of this, how they did that. And then in 1 Timothy 5, uh, 5 and verse 17, they are to rule well. They are to work hard, um, especially in teaching and preaching and, and, and be worthy of a double honor. And the last thing we talked about before we go on to verse 25 is what is our attitude toward our elders? What should be our attitude, you and I? In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 19, we're told, do not receive an accusation against an elder except there be at least two or three witnesses. Also in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, we're to submit to our elders. We are to obey our elders. We are to recognize in our hearts that they keep watch over our souls. We are to remember that they are to give an account for us. That's important because he goes on to say because they are to give an account for us, we are to make sure that they do their job watching over us without us you and I as individual Christian causing them grief. And he goes on to say a frightening thing for every one of us. If we cause them grief, he says, then it would be unprofitable for you, for me. And I think that's so important that we realize that. Sometimes... We might question them, huh, Daryl? <laughs> we might say, uh, well, I wonder what in the world they're doing. I cannot figure that out. <laughs> and I've been guilty of, I mean, this is an example. I've been guilty of going to Daryl and saying, what would they, what do they mean? But where's the best way to handle it? Go to them. <laughs> That's what I've done. Go to them. I, I don't understand. Would you... Would you clarify this for me? I'm having a hard time with this. Would you tell me? Here's something to keep in mind. Our four elders, they're good men, aren't they? They're good men. And let me tell you something. Before they meet, or while they're meeting, when the meeting starts, what do you think the first thing is they do? They pray. What do they pray for? Guidance. I'm sorry? Guidance. Say it again, Barbara. Guidance. 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 Thank you. Guidance. Guidance. Then they pray for us. Then they pray for them. <laughs> they got a world pressure. And they pray for over, all four of them, of what, how they're going to lead this congregation, what direction they're going to take the congregation in. And they, they're doing this together. And, and so we can't complain, be a constant complainer. Something that is a constant irritating on them constantly or we're causing them what? What are we causing them? We just said it. Grief. We're to remember they are to watch over us. They have 
What's the highest position of the church as far as leadership on this earth? Hmm? On this earth. Say it. The eldership. They've been given this responsibility and we're not to cause them any grief. I mean, that's the bottom line. Or it would be unprofitable for us. The reason I brought all this up, again, is because in Acts chapter 20, Paul is heading for Jerusalem. His third missionary journey is just about come to an end. And he's hooking it. He wants to get to Jerusalem by Passover. And he's willing to get on a boat and just go as hard as he can until he gets there. He stops at these islands. He stops at, he go, even goes past Ephesus. He was at Ephesus for three years. He worked with all those Christians there. He especially, he worked with those elders at Ephesus. And he wants to see them. He doesn't care how bad he wants to go to Jerusalem. He's in a hurry to get there. But the first thing he's going to do, he's going to get close to Ephesus, pull into a seaport, and send word to meet me. Meet me. I want to see you. I will never see you again. And I want to see you before I go on to Jerusalem. So let's see why. In verse number 25. And now behold, I know that all of you among who I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I do not shrink from departing or declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard, he says in verse number 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know, verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. And now, he says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What's sanctified? set apart for God. Verse 33. I had coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's easy to put this event in your mind. Nobody needs to draw a picture for you. It's all right here. And you can see it unfold. He's meeting with them. He's down there on the sea coast with them. He's trying to say some last words of encouragement and exhortation. He's trying to build them up, but he's also trying to do what? Warn them. Warn them. 
He says in verse 25, they will no longer see his face. They will not see him again. Can't you imagine how they were crushed in the heart? They loved him. They depended on him. And you're not going to see him again. You can imagine in our minds we can see this take place. He says, I'm innocent of the blood of all men in verse 26. He had not failed ever to teach others to declare the whole counsel of God. He has always, verse 37, preached the truth. Or 27, I mean. I said 37. Verse 28. Here's, here's the thing that gets you. I don't know when to go there. I'm, I want to go to Revelation chapter 2. But I don't, I, I don't know the best time to get there. <laughs> so we'll do that last. <laughs> Verse 20, 28. He says, be on guard for yourselves. He's, what's he telling them? What's he telling those elders? What, is it, what happens when God tells us to be on guard? What are we to be on guard about? Put on the whole armor of God. So that what? You can withstand. Yeah. The devil. And to be on guard for yourselves means that we have to be knowledgeable of God's word. Isn't that true? How can we watch ourselves? If we don't even know what God requires of us in our lives as Christians because we're not knowledgeable of His Word. Well, isn't that what He's telling them to, His elders? That they are be on guard, that they're to watch themselves, that they are be make sure that they're always solid in the truth and make sure that whatever teacher in this building, let's take this building, the elders are responsible for what is taught from the little ones all the way to us to our age. That's how they're watching over us. They're responsible for what's being taught, that it's the truth. But so are we as individuals. So were they as individuals. Be on guard yourselves and for all the flock among you which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers they are to shepherd the church which Jesus Christ purchased with his own blood boy this is a very special message to the elders even today what a responsibility they have first they are to watch themselves second they are to watch the flock the church the Holy Spirit made them overseers. Third, they are to shepherd the church of God, which Jesus purchased with his own blood. He's telling them, he's telling our elders today these things. And he's telling us so that you and I will have the proper respect and the proper support they need Boy, these, these men of ours, they need our support. <clears throat> right here, this is a little bit off. Right here, I see, if anyone ever says the church is not important, it's the same thing as saying Jesus' blood is not important. Verse 29 and 30, he says, I know that after my departure, after I leave you, after I'm gone from this world, but after I leave you, savage wolves will come in. And they'll come in not only among you, but they won't spare anybody. They will not spare the flock. The devil done has everybody else in the world. Boy, who does he really want? <laughs> He wants us. He wants to destroy the church. That's his mission. That's what he 
wants to do more than anything. And we can imagine in our own lives when someone falls away, a Christian, you can know what the devil's doing. Oh, he's celebrating. He wants to destroy the church. He wants to destroy us from our faithfulness, destroy us from clinging to what is good. said, men are going to arise. Not only are they going to come up in the church and among themselves, among their own elders, speaking these perverse things to draw away people from the church. What a warning. <laughs> drawing away Christians with them. It's going to happen to them, to who he's talking to. And it's going to happen when, Larry? Today. Now. There's not a dime's worth of difference with them elders being on the seaport and listening to Paul as us studying and knowing what God is telling us. We have to be on guard. We, they got some sweet words, I'm telling you. They got some real sweet words. We have to watch for it. The devil wants to destroy us, destroy the church. They were to remember Paul was with them night and day. He says three, three years Paul did not cease to admonish them. He did, and he did so in tears. He was always there for them every day. Yes, for those three years. I know you have you've seen families fall apart. Uh-huh. The main person or father or somebody draw. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That's what he's telling them about. You know, he's fixing to leave. You know, keep, hold, you know, keep on, keep it on. Hold on to the truth. Hold on to the truth. Yes, sir. And we have to do that today, don't we? More than ever. Verse 32. He says, and now I commend you. Now I commend you to God. Also, the grace that that brings. Salvation that we have that builds you up, he says. This grace of God gives you an inheritance among all Christians. We have this inheritance. We're sanctified. We're set apart for God. Look right quick at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Hold your place there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. As soon as I get there. Begin at verse 9. That's not what I wanted. I can't remember what I wanted. <sighs> It'll come to me later. My old mind just not working right. I'll be, uh, it'll come to me in a little later. We'll go back there. Verse 33. I, had, I have coveted, he says, no one's silver or gold or clothes. He, Paul says, I worked with my own hands. I, I ministered to my own needs. And, and also for the, the men that were with him in verse 34. They supported themselves working. In Ephesus, what was he? A tent maker in Acts chapter 18. He was a tent maker. He was always ready and willing to work. In verse 35, he says, In everything I showed you that by working hard, they were able to help the weak. He says, To remember the word of the Lord. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you know that this saying of Jesus isn't recorded in the Gospels? 
that it, it is Paul. It's recorded here, and Paul is quoting Jesus here. And, and, uh, and we know that it's the actual words of Jesus. It is his words. It appears to be, there appears to be, a, 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 there may be a collection of sayings of Jesus that people in the Gospels, it's not there, that people are, were aware of by Paul anyway right here. It doesn't really matter because Paul knew it was Jesus' words and we accept that and we believe it. It was his words. So in verse 36 through 38, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving, especially over the word which he had spoken to them, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. We don't have any trouble understanding this. He, this touches deep in our hearts to say goodbye, to walk him to the dock, to see him kneeling and praying with them. The, I tell you, when, when I think of that, the only closest thing I can think of is, boy, everybody in here thinks their dad is something else. I did. Something else. Way up on the pedestal. And once when he died, we were, my brothers and I, four, five boys in the front yard, bawled and squalled and said, some of them said, I never told, I got to tell him I love him. I never had to say that. Thank goodness. And, and just heartbroken because they knew they wouldn't see him again. That, that don't even come close to how the elders felt about Paul leaving. But when you talk about grieving, you talk about touched by the words that he told them. Yes, sir. Yes. But yet they sorrowed most of all because they wouldn't see him anymore. Yeah. Could that could that show an ideology that maybe they were already not thinking about the seriousness of his warning? And more about him? It was more of a personal thing about what yeah. he brought to that church. Yeah. You think that's an indicator maybe where their thinking was already at that time? It could have been. They were sorry most of all yeah. because they wouldn't it could have been. That's right. It could have been. Let's go ahead and go to Revelation chapter 2 while we're there. In that thought. Revelation 2 and verse 2. Revelation 2 and verse 2. How long do you think that it was <laughs> from the time the church was established in Ephesus until the writing in Revelations warning the church in Ephesus. Well, I wonder, I don't know exactly, but how many, how many years do you think? I'm, I'm sorry, Nancy? I mean, yeah, probably around 50 years. Sure could have been. And now notice what has happened. We had these elders that were so loving, so what I'm trying to say is uh, their abilities. They were strong. That's what I was looking for. Strong in the faith. They knew God's word. And watch what happens. 
Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary, but I have this against you. That you've left your first love. Did that happen overnight? They just wake up one morning and they'd left their first love? Huh? How about when we fall away? Does it just happen overnight? No. They have to constantly be on alert. We have to constantly be on alert. We have to guard ourselves. The, the, the shepherds have to guard us. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens little by little. Acceptance of things little by little. Congregations deciding, well, it's okay. Let's, let's do it that way. And, and as... They have no authority to do so. And then it grows and it develops and it goes into something else and more worse and, and more acceptance and worse and more acceptance. You've left your first love. Verse 5. Therefore remember from where you have fallen we have to do that sometime, don't we? We have to remember exactly what we stood for. Exactly what God's Word teaches. Remember from where you have fallen. And do what? Repent. Repent. And do the deeds you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you what? Repent. So you can see where they went. You can see all the great things they did. But then you can see gradually what happened. And he's telling them they need to come back to their first love. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Because Timothy, who was the preacher in Ephesus, it's interesting in 2 Timothy, I wish you'd read chapter 3, and start with 1 and read through verse 5. There's an indication Paul was telling Timothy when he was going to be preaching to Ephesus, be, be aware of this type characteristic that's going to infiltrate the church. Yes, sir. Right now. Second Timothy chapter 3. Uh, yes, sir. What we're saying here, if you read the book of Judges, this happened a long, long time ago. It's nothing new today. No, sir. Not dimes worth a difference. I want to read, uh, if I may, uh, Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. Judges chapter 2, verse 6 through 10. Now when Joshua had sent the people away, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served Jehovah all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of Jehovah that he had wrought for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Jehovah, died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they buried him in the borders of his inheritance in Timiphorim, 
in the north of the mountain of Gaish. And also all that generations were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them that knew not Jehovah, and yet the work which he had wrought in Israel. So just as quick as Joshua died, and the elders that served under Joshua died, them people went astray. One generation from apostasy. Yes, sir. Apostasy. Yes, sir. And that's what it, all it takes today, isn't it? That's all, all we just, got to do is just follow, join follow, and teach it, and preach it, or else what? Just drop the ball. One, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Just to get weak. Us get weak. Especially today, just this, this week on the news media about this one thing that happened in a sports world with a transgender girl mm -hmm. wants to raffle boys. And I guarantee you, the biggest part of the United States of America is going to back her, and the news media is going to support her. Yeah. Probably not. You're right. That's the way the world is. They make evil good. Now, Second Timothy chapter 3, beginning verse 1. I'm, I'm going to start at verse 1. But realize this, Paul says, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, that Paul was discussing holding to a form of godliness although they have denied its power avoid such men as these for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth and, <coughs> and then he mentioned a couple of people who did that you know, I was talking to somebody earlier this, this, this applies to a bit of this when we have our problems if we go to the worldly people to resolve our problems we're going to have worldly Worldly solution. <laughs> yeah. Those are our elders. <laughs> yeah. We'll get God's answer. We'll get God's answers. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> just in just one generation is all it takes. It only takes for us to be weak. And our children are gonna be weak. In the uh, end of verse 38, he had worked with them for three years. He had taught them the good news. And goodbyes are always sad. They are. They're always sad. That they wouldn't see him again. And we know what took place by reading Revelation. Chapter 2 makes it so vital that we, that we know the truth, that we study God's Word, that we are not the generation that leads to another generation under, under us falling away. Yeah, he knew, he knew. Paul knew what they were going to do, didn't he? 
Any other comments before we stop? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Gideon did that in Judges. Gideon did it. He burned down his father's altar to Baal and the wooden image. Uh, the people came back to God. They were under the midnights, and, and he defeated an, a million men or however many they had. He had a, as many as locusts, the enemy. And old Gideon just had 300 men dedicated to God. Anybody else? And you been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood?